In this video, we're going to be talking about everything you need to know when it comes to buying an investment property. And in the end, I'm actually going to give a personal example as to some of my advice when to buy an investment property and what to think of it as. Hey, it's Jeff Chubb. I'm a retired investment banker turned real estate agent. I've sold more than a thousand houses and I'm here with... Sam Leopolis. I'm one of the top 300 loan officers in the United States and I work with Guaranteed Rate. So Sammy, what are some of the best reasons ultimately why people purchase investment properties? The big three of investments are stocks, bonds, and real estate. Stocks and bonds are a lot more of a mindless investment than real estate. However, real estate offers an investor more than passive in income, builds equity over time, and can be a major write-off. So when initially thinking about making an investment, I think there are really four things to consider. You need to consider what type of tenant that you're looking for, what type of involvement that you're ultimately looking to have, what type of property you're looking for, and whether you're looking to have a large monthly return or if you're looking for a large asset value increase return. All right, so I know the other two, but you're going to have to unpack type of tenant for me. I can do that, sure. Maybe the type of tenant that you're ultimately looking for are college students, right? Or my family's investment company, actually, they specifically look for Section 8 tenants as the rent premiums. They were higher, and it was also a guaranteed check each and every single month. Maybe you're looking for short-term uh, rental tenants like Airbnbs or a vacation property. These different types of targeted tenancy would ultimately affect which type of investment property you're going to be looking for and ultimately buy. That makes a lot of sense. And I think the type of investment is a really important uh, important one. I see people all the time wanting to buy an investment property, thinking they're just going to sit back and collect the check. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, you can do this, but you need to pay a property management company to manage the property. If this is what you want, great. Um, and if that's the case, then it will cost you a pretty penny each month. 100%. I mean, real estate investments not for the fan of, fan of heart. And property management companies, they are great but they're gonna cost you, which leads us to the type of property. Are you looking for maybe a single family home or multifamily home or maybe a condo? The interesting thing about a condo is that if you're looking for passive income and don't do much investment, then maybe you might be able to get away with uh, no property management company if you're actually buying a condo with a professional management company that manages the condo association. Then there's whether you're looking for a high monthly return or a high asset return. So talk to me about that one a little bit, Sammy. Yeah, it's hard to have both, at least in the short term, because each, each type means that you're looking for a different type of investment property. Maybe it's a big asset return by investing in an up and coming area or investing in areas that provide for a very high monthly rental return. Yeah, there really is ultimately no wrong answer here. It's, it's really just your answer. It's what worked best for you and what you're looking for in your risk and return profile. I will say that generally saying the older you are, then really the less risky the investments probably should be. All right, so let's talk about why people actually do this. They do it for the returns, but there are some things to think about when it comes to investment property returns. My list goes which, which area and cap rate you're looking in, how bed how beds drive the rental premiums, what work you could do to create equity, increase your monthly returns, and what to expect for a right return out of the gate when you buy that property. All right, so well, you're the finance guy, so I think you should be the one that ultimately talks about cap rates and how the area that you buy in actually drives those cap rates. But first, I think it should probably make a lot of sense for you to describe what does cap rate stand for. Sure, uh, cap rate stands for capitalization rate. It is used to estimate the investor's potential return on their investment in the real estate market. The cap rate is calculated by dividing the net income by asset value. Okay, so that is what it is. How is it used and how are different areas factored in? Ultimately, the higher the cap rate, the higher the return, and the more risky the investment. So as an example, the cap rate for a property in the back bay will most likely be lower than the cap rate in Alston. Okay, that all makes sense. So the more risky the investment, then the higher operating return that is demanded by the investor to compensate for that risk is kind of the best way to say it. So an investment in, say, Brockton will ultimately lead to a higher operating return than maybe an investment in the back bay. So explain why somebody might want to choose an investment in the Back Bay over Brockton then. All right. So it would be ultimately because it is considered just a more safe investment. Let's turn back to 2028, the great market correction. The Back Bay was one of the best performing areas with a very small dip in values mm -hmm. that bounced back very quickly. So compared to Brockton, who saw values fall by more than half. So Sammy, talk to me more about bedrooms and how they work in an investment property's return. 
Beds are one of the main drivers of revenue. So let's say you were looking at two investment properties in the same area. Both are about 1,000 square feet, but one is a bedroom and the other one, one is, one is a one bedroom and the other one is a two bedroom. And the one bedroom is on the market for $490,000. And the two bedroom is on the market for $500,000. Speaking in generalities, the two bedroom is gonna drive a higher monthly rent rate and therefore may actually be a better investment, even though the one bedroom is $10,000 less expensive. And I actually know from an appraisal issue, which you deal with a lot, the appraisers are always looking at the bedroom counts very closely when they're estimating rental roles in order to help uh, an investor obtain that financing. Correct. So let's talk about equity because people buy these things to not only make month money monthly, but also to make money on that asset value. So there are two ways to make equity. Make the market appreciation and to make equity off of improvements. When you talk about market appreciation, that means you and your neighbors will essentially appreciate at whatever the market is. And to say it in any other way, you are 100% receptacle to whatever the market does. Then there's the improvement appreciation. It's important to know which improvements provide you actually a positive return. For example, updating a furnace will not provide any real gain in appreciation, but putting in a new kitchen or a bath, that's gonna provide you a return over and above your investment, provided that you stay within bounds. What do you mean by stay within bounds? Okay. So you don't want to overspend for the type of property it is. Think of it this way. You wouldn't want to put marble countertops in a $300,000 investment property. Now, there are two reasons why. The first is that it's an over-improvement. The second mm -hmm. is that marble, well, it's a soft stone that needs extra care and most likely would get destroyed with tenants. That makes a lot more sense. So. Let's talk about expected returns when you buy an investment property. So if you're using debt to buy the property in our metro market, then I feel that in the beginning, if you're breaking even each month, then you're winning. Breaking even and winning? How so? Yes, if you've gotten the fixed financing, the biggest part of your expenses are already locked in. But with the rental hike increases each year, the property in the long term will become a cash cow of an investment. Okay. So, you know, I, I actually personally can't agree more with you. Uh, I actually have a two family in East Boston and this was my first property. I lived in one unit and rented out the other for other at first, but then moved in with my, well now wife and rented my personal unit as well. Now I remember at the time we were making something like 500 bucks a month and we were pumped, but fast forward 10 years later and today we make something like $1,500 a month. I, I gotta tell you, I don't regret much in life, but boy do I regret not buying, not doing anything I can buy more of those things back in 2008, 2009. I mean, that thing has become a grand slam of investment. But let's flip the script for a second. What are some things for potential investors to be cautious of? Well, I think the most obvious one is the prospect of a bad tenant. I wish I could guarantee every client who is buying an investment property that all will go well, <laughs> and there won't be any issues, but that is not real life. No, it is not. Yeah, this is a serious issue and why banks actually require buyers to have reserves, no? Exactly. Imagine you have a property and the tenants stop paying. You aren't able to just get that tenant out and re-rent the property. It takes time and it takes, states like Massachusetts, it takes a lot of time. You have to go through the entire eviction process. It could take up to four to six months before you have gone through the courts and gotten an eviction order. I mean, four to six months is actually pretty quick. But yes, that one has always scared me. That is why I personally, I'm willing to accept my below market rents because I'm bad at increasing rents because I'd rather have the good tenants that I know are low maintenance and they pay their rent on time. It's ultimately a trade that I'm always happy to make. So to go along with bad tenants, then we probably should take a second and talk about the friendly tenant laws. Yeah, the state of Massachusetts is very tenant friendly. They're almost always given the benefit of the doubt in a more favorable timeline when it comes to evictions. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to trying to get rid of a tenant, you need to cross your T's and dot your I's because if you miss one thing, you're starting right back at the beginning. Why don't you talk about how not all improvements will pay you back? Absolutely. I was you know, giving that marble countertop example earlier, but when you own an investment property, then you need to have a different mindset. You want to be smart with the improvements that you make. Stick with kitchens and baths, floorings and paint. Now, getting into structural changes or an addition is really just a losing proposition. Actually, another example that I just thought of would be windows. That increases the energy efficiency of the house, but a tenant's not going to pay you any more for the property because it's got new windows. All right, so you mentioned you want to talk about a personal example that could be some great advice. Yeah, so I mentioned a couple seconds ago, I got that first property that I purchased, that two-family in East Boston. I put 3.5% down when buying that guy. 
I still own that house today. When I bought it, I told myself that this would just be my kids' college education and that when they went to college, then I would sell the property. Now, this was almost some great advice. Over the years, I've changed it a little bit from selling and now I'm just gonna refinance it. Ultimately, my kids, they're gonna end up selling that property someday. My rent roll, it continues to grow and provide a nice bonus check to the family each and every single month. My wife and I have never been worried or saved a dime for a 529 as it's all taken care of. I have an exceptional investment property, all for only three and a half percent down. So what are you gonna do when number three comes along? Kid number three. Kid number three, yeah. Man, it's killing me. But I figure this one, multifamily, can send two of my kids to college, but probably not that third kid. So my wife and I, we're going to go out and we're going to look for another investment probably probably within the next 12 months. You know, that's going to be kid number three's college education. If it, you know, it, if it breaks even on that day one, then that's the win. And then eventually I know it's going to start cash flow positive on us. And the tenants are going to pay down that mortgage and the property is going to increase in value. And well, there's our college education. I love it. Well, I think we did it. This is what you need to know when it comes to buying an investment property. If you're thinking about making a move in Massachusetts, then be sure to reach out to this guy. He's one of the top agents in the state and will take great care of you. I can't begin to tell you how much experience matters and finding a quality agent will make the difference between a good experience and a miserable one. You know, and if you're thinking about buying a house in Massachusetts or really anywhere in the country, then Sammy, he can be the guy that can help you. He works for the number two lender in the country and is one of their top 10 brokers in the company. Now, I've worked with a lot of mortgage brokers in the past, and I say I can say this with certainty, not because he's, well, quite frankly, standing next to me, but he is truly one of the best in the business, and you're not going to regret reaching out to this guy. So all of our contact information, it's in the description below. So let us know if you have any questions, but until next time.